Let's pray together. Father, I'm so thankful for the power of your anointing and your Holy Spirit, and I feel your presence here, and I'm thankful for that. And I pray, Almighty God, that you would continue to watch over each and every one of us, that our faith would be increased, that we would leave here changed people, that we would be better when we leave than we were when we showed up today, and we would receive your word with such joy and gladness, Father. You are mighty to save, and we're so thankful for that. And so, Father, I just pray, Almighty God, that you would have your way among us here today, Father, and that we would be so excited about walking in your truth. We love you, Father. And we thank you, God Almighty, that you have allowed us to see another day in this house. In Jesus' name and blood we pray. Everybody said in agreement, church. Amen. Let's give God a clap and a shout of praise. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. His presence is strong. Turn, please, in your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Luke, chapter 15. We're going to begin with the first verse, Luke, chapter 15, verse 1. Chapter 15, beginning with the first verse. God is so good, amen? Ah, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. When you're there, say, I'm ready to grow. Okay, only by the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke 15, verse 1. This is what the Word of God says, friends. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so they're talking about Jesus uh, being close with the unrighteous here. Verse 3. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, verse 7, there will be more joy in heaven over how many sinners? One. There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Okay, now, I'm excited about this passage of Scripture, so just turn, turn my mic down because uh, I'm getting ready to get excited. And when my mic is hot, I can't get excited because I don't want to hurt your ears. Uh, I, I'm so excited about this passage of Scripture. He says, well, which one of you, when you have 99 uh, does not go after the what? One. And today we're going we're gonna to look in Scripture about what the Word of God talks about as we, as Christians, our job to go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tell your neighbor, you have a job. And we're going we're gonna to look at what we're called to do, friends, because as Christians, it is our job to bring people to Jesus Christ. It's not our job to just get saved for ourselves. Now, now go, go back to the text. Uh, go, go, go to Luke 15. Look at verse 7, Luke 15, 7. Scripture says, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over how many sinners? Now, now, do you know that at one time that was you? I think about that. This is incredible. At one time, that text is speaking of you. There was one time where you were a sinner. But do you know that, and Pastor Jim and I were talking about this earlier this week, we, we got to stop this stuff of, 
we're, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, no, no. Once you become a child of God, you're no longer categorized as a sinner. You're a saint who sometimes slips up in sin. You understand that? You've got a new bloodline. You've got a new family line. For instance, well, my wife, uh, her maiden name is Gunderson, but she married in, and her legal name is now Day. You, you, you understand what I'm talking about? You've got to get out of your head this business that you're still a sinner saved by grace. No, you're a child of God. You've got to understand that you're a saint that just sometimes messes up. And so at one time, every one of us, we were that individual that the text right here is speaking of, and that when we received Jesus and we became that new creature, all of heaven erupted. All of heaven erupted over you. And I'm a firm believer that when the angels rejoice over one sinner, that everybody else that has gone on before us in your family, in my family, when heaven erupts and rejoices, they know what's, what's going on and what's rejoicing over. And so somewhere on the day that when Lee got saved and when you got saved, your family and loved ones and friends that went on before you say, whoa, what's going on? Lee just received Christ and an eruption occurred. Donnie just received Christ. Ken received Christ, Mike received Christ, Melissa received Christ, and an eruption occurred. And this is going on, listen, according to the text, and what it's telling us, this goes on in heaven constantly, because every day souls are being brought into the kingdom of God. Constantly. Constantly. It's our job to get out there and share this with people. See, it should be our passion as, as Christians. It should be our passion and, and the, sharing the gospel. And listen, friends, it can only become our passion when we truly realize what Jesus did for us and then we walk in that every day. It can only become your passion when you get excited about it. It can only be your passion when you live in it. It becomes our passion when we realize that there is more to life than just what we see in the physical realm on this earth. But the reality is, listen, friends, the reality is this, that there is heaven and there is a hell. How many of you believe that? It's easy to believe in a heaven, but the reality is that there is a hell. And Jesus Christ, hear me, friends, Jesus Christ is the absolute only way to get into heaven with God for eternity. The only way. You see, we, we have to be careful, church, not to let our focus just so be on the 99 that we don't have any passion or compassion for the one. The 99, listen to me, the 99 represents the busyness of everything that we've already got going on in our life. How many people are busy, right? If you don't, see me afterwards. You, got, you ain't got enough to do. Well, we're, we're all busy uh, at one time or another, and the 99 represents the busyness of everything that we've already got going on in life, and it's the 99 that can cause us to pass by the one every day of our lives if we allow it. The routine, the busyness, the scheduling, it's, it's, it's all of that craziness that although it can be good things, can cause us to miss out on the one. We pass by the one at our jobs. We pass by the one at our schools and our college campuses. We pass by the one at the grocery stores, at hospitals, at gas stations, and even in our own family members. We pass by the one all the time. Some of you in here are desperately praying for your spouse to receive salvation. I implore you, never give up. See, our, our heart cry, and I hope this is where we are by the end of service, our heart cry should be, God, make us dedicated to fight for the one that has not found you yet. I'm so thankful for the one that fought for me and for the ones that fought for you all as well. Go to Jude chapter 1. Actually, there's only one chapter in Jude, so if you find it, you won't miss it. It's just before Revelation. And if your Jude has more than one chapter, you need to throw that book away. And while I'm on to that, if you have a Bible in here that is the message Bible, you need to throw that away. There's a trash can just in the foyer on the left when you exit. Please place it in there. We'll take care of it. 
if you're reading from the Message Bible, you need to understand that that is one man's translation, that is one man's opinion, that is watered down mess. They have taken the word sin out, they have taken the words homosexuality out, they have so watered it down that it has gotten farthest from the truth. If you have the Message Bible, eat the cost on it. I'll give you a free Bible, okay? Listen, if you're currently reading the Message Bible, I'll make a trade with you. You give me the Message Bible, and I'll give you a brand new actual Bible. Everybody say deal. Okay, there it is. Jude, look at verse 17. You got to be careful what you're reading, amen? Just because someone puts the word Bible on it doesn't make it legitimate. Jude, look at the 17th verse, and we're going to read for a moment. Jude 17, but you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to what, church? Eternal life. Verse 22, and have mercy on those who what? Doubt. Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others. Watch this, verse 23. Save others by snatching them out of the fire to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Let's talk about this for a moment. Unless there is an intervention, everybody hear me. Unless there is an intervention, the unsaved soul is on its way to hell. Everybody hear that? That's just what it is. If that makes you uncomfortable, then you just need to line up with the truth. Because that is the truth. If there, unless there be an intervention, the unsaved soul is on its way to hell. Scripture says that we're born into what? Sin. And so there must be an intervention. And the only way to reroute that path is by that individual accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior of their lives. And it's our job to inform the people of the truth. Tell your neighbor, that's our job. To inform the people of the truth. That listen, listen, I know that you may not want to hear this, but, but I love you so much, I respect you so much, I appreciate you so much, I've just got to let you know whether you believe it or not. I am called in conviction by God to share my faith with you. If you do not repent of your evil ways and, re and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, there's only one way that you're heading, friend, and that's to hell. Not the easiest of cakes to bake and taste, is it? But it will save their soul for eternity should they choose to grab on to the good news of Christ. You understand that we got to get we got to get away from this issue of being too fearful of hurting people's feelings. I mean, don't, don't, don't get caught up in feelings. Uh, ne listen, listen to me. Never follow your feelings. We should follow the what? Spirit. The Word of God says that we're to stay in step with the what? Spirit. Not stay in step with our feelings. How many of you did something because you felt like you should, only to regret that you did it because you felt like you should? And so if you could trust feelings, you'd never mess up. But the fact of the matter is, our feelings sometimes are all messed up. How many of you have had messed up feelings before? Yep. Some of you rode here feeling bad about your wife. That's messed up, ain't it? Ladies, some of you feel messed up about your husband. That's messed up, ain't it? Some of you rode here and didn't speak to one another possibly because of what happened before you left. Who knows? God forbid. You can't trust your feelings. Your feelings get you in trouble. But the Spirit of God will never lead you where God does not want you. 
You believe that? The Spirit of God will never lead you to where God Almighty does not want you. Let me, let me take you somewhere else in Scripture. Go, go to Luke 15 again. How many of you know that without Jesus Christ, hell is the outcome from, for eternity? Do you believe that? That's the truth. That's the absolute truth. Let me share with you something that happened to my family yesterday. We went fishing, and there was a big, a big bass tournament had just ended, and there were guys with these nice beautiful sixty, seventy thousand dollar boats off to the side and they had just finished the weigh in and so they're hanging out around the dock where they took the big bass and let them back go and and everything was great well uh i felt i don't want to say inferior but i got all nervous because here i come uh not that i need some big boat like that like they got but whenever you know some people just go to the boat ramp to watch people be idiots do y'all know what i'm talking about Trying to back down, you jackknife in, try to get it straight. Man, I'm not beat the sweater coming. My wife, she probably doesn't understand this. She's like, wow, why do you look like you can't think right when you get around these people? I'm just, <laughs> please, everyone, just go home so I can back my boat in the water. Ha! I'm out there racing. We, we, we just had a few hours in the evening, and so we went and took, took the family. We go out there. I'm out. My wife said, how come something always goes wrong? When I come with you, I'm like, because you make me nervous. <laughs> she says that it's just because she's there to actually see it go wrong, that it regularly happens that way, but that's not the case. And so <laughs> so we, so I, I, I'm unstrapping the boat. I'm, I'm getting everything straight. I'm, I'm just a hot mess, man. I don't mind telling you I'm a hot, ugly mess. And these guys are probably looking at me like, rookie, you know. So I get the boat in the water, we shove off. I'm like, Phew. I'm just going to get out of sight of these guys. And the wife says in all wisdom, hey, there's water coming in the floor of the boat. <laughs> if you've ever owned a boat for any amount of time, you've probably committed that one dreadful sin at some time or another. And if you haven't, I guarantee one day you will. Forgot to put the plug in. I look down and the cup holders in the floor are filling up with water. <laughs> I look at the guys at the weigh-in station and they're kind of just watching, you know, because they're ready for me to fire that motor up and take on off, you know. And I'm like, oh, man. I had more pressure on me because there was this family backing this pontoon trailer down into the water to take their pontoon out. And so I couldn't go back to the dock because he was bringing out his boat. And there won't be one thing I could do, fellas. Empty the pockets, took off the shirt, and into the water this scuba diver went. You ever try to fix a plug out of the water and it don't want to cooperate with you? It's got to swell up so it can fill the hole up. Try being in the water where your feet can't touch the ground. One arm's up here holding on to the boat. Another one's trying to tighten this thing up like this. <laughs> Kicking the whole time, man. <laughs> the wife thinks the boat's sinking. <laughs> She's at the front. I put her in charge of doing the trolling motor without teaching her how to do the trolling motor. So we're spinning circles. I'm riding this thing like a rodeo. Go straight! Go straight! <laughs> All these big wigs up on land just watching. I have become entertainment. A humbling experience. I'm just going to trust it was from the Lord. Uh, she says, We're sinking! Well, I know that the boat really wouldn't sink. It would just kind of get water level and just kind of hover. So I pop up over the end by the motor and I say, will you just honor me and be quiet? (laughs) 
Go straight, woman! <laughs> There's not one exaggeration to that story at all. It happened 100% like that, I promise. I've, I've withheld details for the sake of time. It was even uglier than that, trust me. It was uglier than that. Have you ever tried to climb into the boat with no ladder? You just... I get up on the bow of the boat. I look over out of the corner of my eye and everybody's staring at me. Soaking wet, man, soaking wet. I just put the foot on the trolling motor and off we went. <laughs> that really happened yesterday. I share that with you to say this. So let's parallel that story. It's good to have fun in church, but let's, let's get some relevance out of it. Without Jesus Christ in our lives, we are that sinking boat. We're, we're, we're treading water, man. We're, 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 we're in a rut. We're just, we're just spinning circles trying to hold on to life. And we're, we've got that plug, and we're just trying to figure it out on our own. And if, if, if what we're using is not Jesus, you're just going to keep spinning circles. Because Jesus is the only way for salvation. Just like, just like to that boat, the plug is the only way to keep water out. There's, there's no, repla no, no, no replacement to that. You can't wedge your thumb up in there. It has to take the certain tool, the certain device to fit in there. Matter of fact, the plug for boats are so universal, it doesn't matter what kind of boat you have. If your boat takes a plug, it's going to, for the most part, take the same type of plug that the $80,000 boat costs, that the $60,000 boat costs, that the $500 boat costs. You go right down to Walmart and get you the same plug for all of them. When it comes to our lives, Jesus is it, man. He's it. If you're here today and you've not received Jesus, you need to. If you're here today and you've received Jesus, but you're not picking up the cross daily and walking with him, you need to. Some people, some people ask Jesus to say, listen to this. Some people ask Jesus to save their souls and they follow after the Lord for a little while. But then, but then they don't understand that when the weight of the world hits them, rather than press more into Jesus, they get back into self trying to fix that plug, spinning in circles, wrestling with the water. And they think that it's Jesus that, that has let them down when really it's self that has let us down because we can't fix it by ourselves. And so anytime we've got an issue in our lives that we just can't figure out, we need to understand it's not up to us to fix. Give it to God. Give it unto God. Luke chapter 15, the eighth verse, the word of God says this, praise the Lord. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Really, we should be excited, and, and I almost don't say this term uh, just because I don't want you to take it wrong, but I, I'm just so excited uh, about, about it, I just want to share it with you. Really, we should be sinner hunting. We should be looking for people that need to get saved. Not so that we get glory, but just because I don't want anyone burning in hell for eternity. I mean, it, it's not going to be a party. Uh, people in hell are not going to be in mass groups. It's going to be individual terror when you study what hell actually is. Individual uh, turmoil and, and pain. Forever. And there will be no one there for you to look upon. There will be no one there to help you. Hell itself will be your only friend. But at the same time, your worst enemy. See, we have to get to the place to where we understand 
that not only is Jesus everything that I need, Jesus is everything that everybody around me needs too. And I just desperately want to let them know if you don't have them, you need them. Because you don't want to end up where you're going if you don't have an intervention of your soul here. You see, it it gives us the analogy. Look at, look at it in Luke chapter 15, beginning with the 8th verse. It gives us the analogy of this woman who has 10 silver coins and she lost one coin. And what we... What we have to understand is that that coin, that silver coin, would have been worth about a day's wage for her. It would have been a day's wage. So let's just say, for an example, let's just say you have $1,000 in your pocket when you go home for church today. And you know when you got home, you had $1,000 cash in your pocket of $100 bills. And you later at dinner went to recount it, and you realized that $100 had fallen out of your pocket somewhere from your yard to your table. How many people, even though you still had $900, would still go look for the $100? No shame in that, is it? See, I know you would because everyone in here is guilty of looking for coins and change and even dollar bills under your couch cushions, aren't you? And what, what, what I'm trying to say is if we, could be that, if we could be that serious and that desperate to find change in a couch and we look at the analogy that, that God has given us in this text in the scripture, how much more should we be concerned about the souls of a man and woman? You know, there's people that make a living clipping and counting coupons. How many people love coupons? There's no shame in that. Raise your hand if you like coupons. Ain't nothing wrong with that. We got some in here. Imagine if the energy that we invested in that, and I'm not saying that cutting coupons is wrong. I'm just saying imagine if we could get excited about lost souls coming saved to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as we did about hunting down coupons in ads. And see, what it is is what I'm telling you. Some people like coupons. Some people like sports. Some people like their boats. Some people like their vehicles. Some people just like nothing. Some people some people just uh, 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 like extracurricular, whatever it is. But what I'm saying is, is that we have gotten so used to placing first, which should not be first in life. And so what it is, we've taken the mentality of blessing the one, and we've, we're looking and focused at the 99. I'm blessed that every one of you come in here every week to receive the word, and my prayer is that it just washes over all of us. Amen? But you know where my heart's at while I prepare for the word for, through the week, and I'm just asking God, God, send me unsaved. Send me unsaved. Send me unsaved. Because if you're saved in here, how many of you already know you're going to heaven if God was to come back, if the Lord was to come back in the next 10 minutes? Okay, so, so, right? So you're going. Amen? I'm looking for the one that right now is not going. You understand what I'm saying? So it's just, hey, look, and it's not just my life's call. Every one of us as a saint of God, every one of us as a Christian has that life call to introduce people unto the Lord. And all that I'm telling you this morning is, We've got that way down here when it should be way up here. And so in this one chapter alone, we're told in three different stories that we're to go and get the one that's lost. We're to go after the one that is lost. You see... If we could see what we're losing, just like we could see that we've lost a $100 bill, if, if we could see what we're losing, if we could understand who Satan is trying to take from us, the family members, the co-workers, the friends, the strangers, the spouses, people in general, our focus must get back to understanding what the war is over. And it is a war raging for our soul. Get them as from the fire. Snatch them. Snatch them. Our focus must get back to the one and their understanding that if Jesus came back and their soul was not saved, that the only place they have left is hell. See, maybe, maybe you've been relentlessly 
albeit credit, maybe you've been trying relentlessly to lead someone to Jesus Christ or to have them attend, come on, just one church service, just one church service, and you feel as though your efforts are burnt out, void, or wasted. Let's just say that. Maybe you feel as your efforts are burnt out, void, or wasted. I'm here to tell you and, and, and spur you on in love and truth that, listen, if your viewpoint is that, that your efforts are burnt out, void, or wasted, that's the farthest from the truth. How many of you believe that your efforts from Christ are never in vain, never wasted, never void? You see, that, that theory of I've tried and I'm not going to try anymore, that is furthest from the truth. You just have to realize, friends, that as hard as you're fighting, now listen to this, as hard as you're fighting to win their soul, you've got to understand that there's an enemy on the other side trying to keep it for his kingdom, not for God. I mean, listen, you've got to believe that. And, and if you can't line up with that way of thinking, I'm telling you, that's the truth, man. That's the truth, woman. That's the truth, whether you can understand that or not. As hard as you're trying to lead someone to Jesus, there is a demon, there is a devil on the other side trying to keep them away from Jesus. And on this battle goes in the unseen realm. And so if you're going to say, well, I've tried, Who in the world is fighting for your spouse now? Who in the world is fighting for your boss to get saved? Who in the world is fighting for your loved ones? Who's fighting and standing in the gap for your children? Who's standing in the gap for your grandchildren? Who's standing in the gap for your family and your friends and your coworkers? If you really want your environment to change, allow God to use you to change it. And start praying for some people. And I'm talking about really praying for some people. If we let go, we may be just the only thing in that person's year. Just think, if we as a saint of God, as Christians, if, if we have the thought process in our flesh to say, I'm just going to stop, I've asked them a million times, and we're saved. Imagine about the people that aren't saved in that person's life, that can't give him the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we were the only beacon of hope that he had, we were the only beacon of hope that she had, and all of a sudden, we take that hope and we turn the light out. What's left? See, it's not about how tired you get. It's about how relentless are you willing to be for the Lord. That's what it's about. The, the apostles all knew that their lives were going to one day be taken from them. But they didn't let that stop them. Thank God they did it because the church that we know today was molded through those brothers. We have to get to the point to where we have such passion, but as Scripture said, mercy on those who doubt that our number one agenda should be focusing on leading the lost souls to the Lord. My true belief, my true belief, and this is not a salvation issue, so we're not going to fight about this right now. Plus, you don't have a microphone, and I do, so we're good. I truly believe that the kingdom of hell will be far more occupied than the kingdom of heaven on the day of the return of the Lord. Isn't that sad? Because it doesn't have to be like that. It's it, it doesn't have to be that way, saints. I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? It, it, doesn't have to, it doesn't have to look like that because God sent his son Jesus so that how many should perish? Go with me, if you will, to Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. While you're turning there, if the, if the folks in the back could get Philippians 4.13 on the, state, on the uh, screen, please. Philippians 4.13. You see, this is what we have to understand. If you're here and you think, well, I've done invited him to church a thousand times. Listen, it may take a thousand and ten. 
but when, when 10 got there, wouldn't it be worth it? When 1,010 got there, wouldn't it be worth it? I mean, for, listen, if, if, you're, if you're tired of, 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 of ministering, of inviting, uh, today you should be encouraged. Philippians 4.13 tells us that we can do all things through him who strengthens me. We can do all things through him who strengthens us. You see, I, listen, this is where you got to be. I'm going to get that person to church. I'm going to keep trying to get them to church. I'm going to keep praying. I will be renewed in my efforts to fight for them and to snatch them from the flames of hell. Because Philippians 4.13 says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so that means if you're burnt out on inviting someone to church, you're not receiving the strength of Christ. Because he came so that how many perish? None. We should not get tired, friends. You know what getting tired is? It's just a weakness and giving up. It's a lack of commitment. It's a lack of dedication. Galatians 6, 9, we see uh, Paul here. Galatians 6, 9, Paul writes, and let us not grow weary of doing what? Good. We're living in a day where the church has grown weary. We're living in a day where the church has even grown weary of hearing the truth. And so there's a need, some feel, to change truth. But if you could change truth, then that means that it was never a truth. Amen? But there is a truth, and it is the word of God, and it is unchangeable. And so we're living in a day where even though Paul writes and tells us to not grow weary, we're living in a day that the very people he was writing for have done exactly that, grown weary. Galatians 6, 9, Paul writes, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in what, church? Due season, we will what? Reap if we do not what? Give up. Now look at it again. Galatians 6, 9, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. Tell your neighbor, keep trying. I mean, think about what it's saying here, you know. Uh, Don't grow weary of doing the right thing. For in due season, so it may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, albeit it could, but it may be next week, it may be next month, it may be next year. But it doesn't change the fact that there's a season coming. Amen? How many of you are looking to fall weather being here? How many of you like seeing the leaves riding through the mountains? One of my favorite things to do, see the leaves in the mountains change. I know that there's a season coming. Unless the Lord intervene and come back to get me before fall, I'm looking forward to the fall. There's there's a season coming, and nothing I do can change that. You understand that? Nothing you do can change that. There is a season coming, and you've got to understand that right here, don't do weary. Do not be weary. Do not be weary of doing good for in what? Due season. In due season, we shall reap as children of God in faith what we're praying for. But if you're just going to say, well, I give up. That's the hundredth time I've invited them to church. They don't want Jesus. You could have been that one lifeline that they had. That even though they acted like they didn't want to hear from you, Inside, they knew that through Christ you were the only hope they had. See, because before they know Jesus, they don't understand Jesus, obviously. So all they know is the hope and the smiley face that you have when you show up to invite them to church. You're the only joy in their life that some people have before getting saved. We cannot just pull the cord on that. So look at it again, that scripture, please. Uh, Philipp, uh, not Philippians, Galatians 6, 9, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we, what? Will. How many of you in here have someone in your life that you desperately want to get saved? And so where your faith needs to be is, I will reap that answer. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, until the season shows up and you can say, I have. See, because unless the Lord comes back first, I will see the leaves change 
or unless the Lord calls me home to heaven first, I will see the leaves change. 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 And then all of a sudden, when I take my little trip to the mountains, I will be able to say I have seen the leaves change. I've gone from will in faith to have from faith. You understand that? And then after that season comes a what? A new season. A new season. And and so look, when we lead one to the Lord, it's our job to invest in that individual, to share in love with that individual. But I'm sinner hunting. I'm looking for someone else that needs to be saved. I'm looking for someone else that needs to be saved. As far as growing them up, praise God, they can come in here and they can get relationships and form friendships with people that can help get them strong and come to Bible studies. My number's on the website. I put it in the emails. Call me if you need me. But I'm sinner hunting. I'm looking for someone that looks down and out, and I'm looking until I, boop, there they are. You're mine. You understand what I'm saying? See, some people feel that that's evasive. I call it concern. I call it concern, church. Not only because Jesus says that I should be, but because I understand that if there's not an intervention of their soul, they're going to hell. And I don't want no one in hell. You ever heard the expression, I don't wish that on my best enemy? You ever heard that? We're so quick to say that about a sickness or something bad that happens in someone's life. But what about the soul of the individual and their eternal status forever? See, here's the hard truth of it all. There are people in this room, there are people in this room that on the day that the Lord returns or the individual leaves, and I'm not judging, I'm just looking at the crowd of the size of the people with the people that's in here and the people that's in there. Uh, anybody, you know how many people's here today? Anybody? It's probably up near 183 after the children left. Okay, so it's almost 200 people in here, a uh, pile of kids next door. So, so once you get up towards close 300 people and that average, the, the truth of the matter is probably not all 300 people are going to heaven. That's not me playing God. That's just me being realistic with you. Okay, because Scripture says that some will say, but Lord, Lord, we baptized in your name, we healed in your name, we prayed in your name. There's some people that think they're getting in just because they had a church experience and they never really had a real walk with Christ. And it's Jesus says, I'll look at you and I'll say, I knew you not. And I don't know any unsaved people that pray in the name of Jesus. I don't know any unsaved people that have tried to heal people in the name of Jesus. I don't have no unf- unsaved friends do that, y'all. Anybody? No. Some people raise their hand. And think about that. So what that means is, is we got, we've got Satan who has snuck into the church and de- deceived the pastors and the leaders, and they're teaching a poison, and they're making their congregation feel good, as Scripture says, a word for itching ears, okay? And this is why Scripture says, test the spirit, because everything that goes on in the house of God that has been invited in is not always welcome. And we have to be very careful to let the people know that there is a truth here, friends. There is a heaven and there is a very real hell. Wake up. Wake up. And my heart's desire is, is that every time every one of you step a foot in this sanctuary, the only thing you hear is the gospel. You have family members. I have family members that desperately need to be saved. We have friends that desperately need to be saved. And I know some of you right now may be overwhelmed and using the excuse, well, I just don't have time for all them because I don't have time for myself. And like I shared with you last week, if you fall into that lie that you're saying God didn't know what he was doing when he put 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week, he's smart. He knows what he's doing. How much time does it really take to walk past somebody at the register? You're paying anyway and say, hey, do you go to church anywhere? You're there anyway. Amen? You're there anyway. 
You go inside the gas station, there's someone on the other side, there's an attendant, you're there anyway. Amen? You're paying for your clothes at, at the clothing store, and there's someone there, you're there anyway. You go down the aisle at, at Food Line or wherever you shop, and someone's in your aisle too, you're there anyway. My wife hates it when I go inside Walmart because she knows it ain't going to be a quick trip. People need to hear about Jesus. I'm either going to run into somebody that's already saved, or the Lord may compel me to share with someone who's not saved. But we need Jesus, man. Amen? I mean, the saved need, we need, we need to release more of ourselves to Jesus, right? We need, to, we need the Lord just take over. I've been hiding this spot of my life from you, but God sees everything. So, Lord, I'll forgive me for not giving you this self of me, but this part of me. But, God, take over. So, so we all need to walk more in tune with the Spirit of God. And then there's more people out there unsaved than is saved. We got time. We're there anyway. Nothing wrong with planning. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is don't be so focused on your 99 that you miss the one that God put right in your pocket. Right in your pocket. Let me show you something in Scripture. Luke 137. You don't have to turn there. Jot that down if you're taking notes. Because some of you may say, Pastor, uh, you don't know, you don't understand how hard my husband's heart is. You, you don't understand how, how hard my brother's heart is. You don't understand how hard my, my dad's heart is. Well, this is what I'm telling you. I know God's word is always true. And in Luke 137, the word of God says, for nothing will be impossible with God. Everybody hear that? So if you say, it's impossible for me to minister to people because I don't have time to minister to my family. No, 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 no. I believe that God knows what he's doing. I believe that God knows what he's saying. All things are possible when God's involved in it. He said, we get, he will make a way. You remember that little uh, gospel tune in your children's church classes? Do we really believe it? Or is it just something we expect other people to believe because we're too focused on the 99 to deal with the one? Do we, do we really believe it? Turn, turn here with me. In, 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 in the word, please. Look at, look at Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Um, Luke 15, 11, the word of God says this. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property and reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. Verse 16, and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And so here this man is finding himself uh, with, with the pigs. And according to his Jewish culture, he wasn't even supposed to be around the pigs. He wasn't even supposed to be touching the pigs, much less feeding or working with the pigs. And here he finds himself eating. He's he wants to eat with the pigs. This was a huge no-no. But I love what the verse says. It says he came to himself. Let me put that in modern day uh, English. He came to his senses. How many of you are thankful that you came to your senses? I mean, thank God that he woke us up out of our stupor. He came to himself. Matter of fact, look at it. Uh, look at it, if you will. Luke 15 in the 17th verse. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger! Exclamation point. He's realized how foolish of a man he's become. 
Verse 18, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, and he ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. See, the good news for everyone in here today, friends, is no matter how low you've been, God is willing to pick you up. That's the truth. Verse 22, but the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Stop right there at the 23rd verse, please. The ring he's talking about is a signet ring. And, and when anyone would see that signet ring, they would know that that's his son or that he's okay to do whatever he says he's going to do in the name of his, of his dad. Uh, the kings would have signet rings. And when they wanted to send a letter, they would, they would put it in some type of covering in an envelope. They would close the envelope, and they would take wax, hot wax, and they would put it on the seal. And then they would take the ring, the signet ring that each king had, and they would press it down into the wax. And so whoever was receiving the letter saw the signet of the king, knowing that this letter truly is of and from the king. And so the daddy says to the servant, Go get my best robe and go get a ring because I want everybody to know that sees my son, that daddy's boy is back home. He's back home. And see, every one of you, listen, 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 listen. If you're here and you're not saved, you're still a child of God. He made you. Everybody understand that? He is your creator, whether you've acknowledged that or not. Just because you don't acknowledge it, it don't mean that some monkey built you in the universe somewhere. Everybody got that? God made you, whether you've acknowledged that or not, you're his. You're his. But there's something that you still have to do, and that is profess Christ as your Savior and be obedient to follow him. To pick up that cross daily. Look at verse 23. Let's go back where we left off. And bring, he said, his dad says, and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is what? Alive again. See, he physically wasn't dead. And so this is, again, I'm telling you, unless there is an, unless someone has an intervention to an unsaved soul, that soul is destined for hell. He says, for he was lost. And is what, church? Found. And they began to what? Isn't it, isn't it cool that the alive celebrated uh, here on this earth? And, and, and the angels and everyone that's gone on before us also celebrate when one sinner comes to repentance. Isn't that so cool? See, I think today as a church, the, the body of Christ has lost excitement when someone gets saved. I so appreciate the, 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 the people that when someone gets saved, we do have some folks that will come forward from here to there in the time of someone leaving to say, hey, congratulations, you did the best thing you'll ever do. And we do have a few here that will come up and hug. But I'm telling you, we need to get better as that as a church. Can I tell you that as, as your shepherds? We, we need to get better. We need to get better that as a church. Someone gets saved up in here, man, we should just overwhelm them with congratulations that they just made the best decision of their life. I mean, they, they should know that by the time they leave here, that they weren't just right to doing what they did because they were led by the Spirit of God to do what they did, but also because of the confirmation that 183 people gave them before they left the door. Ah, we should be so excited about a soul coming into salvation. Because you know what it means? That means that while we were up here pulling, Satan lost his grip. That excites me, man. That excites me. How many of you, how many of you have seen a tug of war game before? I'm talking about a good one, not a children's tug of war. I'm talking about some just that war with one another. Just and it's, there's there's just give and take. There's give and take. There's give and take. There's give and take. There's give and take. But then somewhere in the give and take, time passes by. And somebody who had a stronghold starts.
starts to wear down. And it's either going to be you or it's going to be the demon. That's big news when you understand it like that. It's either going to be you or it's going to be the demon on the other side working that's going to have to give. And I'm just telling you, I don't want it to be you. I'm not perfect. I'm not standing up here saying I'm perfect, but I'm just telling you where my hunger is. I don't want to lose. Hence why I was so humbled and humiliated on the back end of my boat in a lake. That wasn't selfish pride. I just hate to be a loser. None of you, none of you, none of you when you were growing up and your mommy or daddy asked you, what are your grandparents said, what do you want to be when you grow up, little Jimmy? I just want to be a loser, dad. Well, little Jimmy, you work real hard at that, son, and you'll be the best loser that we've ever put out in this generation. This family line is real proud of you, buddy, real good line of losers. No, 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 that's farthest of the truth. Every one of us should hate losing when it comes down to the team of Jesus Christ. Every one of us. Losing should not be an option. Getting tired should not be the option on the point of giving up. You're going to get weary. You're going to get tired. But that's when you're in your strength. You've got to go in the strength of Christ because you can do all things through God who gives you strength. Through Christ. And that's passion, church. That's passion. That's passion when you walk into a store somewhere and you're sinner hunting. We need a shirt that says that, sinner hunting. Hey, that's, listen, I'm telling you, we got to get to the point to where we're looking and listening to hear from the Spirit for Him to check us up and say, no, 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 stop. Ask them how they're doing today. It doesn't mean that you've got to go preach a five-minute sermon to them. Just stop. Ask them how they're doing today. Just ask them how they're doing today. You've got time. I've got time. We've got time. We have time. Absolutely, we've been given enough time. Verse 25, Luke 15, 25. Now, his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. Man, they're having a good time when this guy got saved, aren't they? When he came back to his daddy, rather. Having a good time here. And verse 26 says, And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him in verse 27, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. I mean, you think that's good news, amen, church? But watch what happens in verse 28 with the brother. But he was what? Angry. I mean, he got good news. His, his bubba's home, and he's angry about it. That's selfish thinking, folks. He should be excited at his brother's home, but instead he's angry because his brother's getting special attention. He squandered daddy's uh, inheritance that he had for him. And so what good is my brother, he's thinking, rather than rejoicing in the fact that he's back home safe and sound. Remember, with mercy. Remember scripture said that? Look at those who doubt with mercy. Watch what happens. Verse 28. But he was angry and refused to go in. And his father came out and entreated him. Aren't you so glad that when we get bitter or we get jealous or we get envious that God comes out and lovingly deals with us? I mean, let, let's just free some people here. Let's free some people here. How many of you Christians, including myself, have thought bad about another Christian before? And didn't you feel bad about that sooner or later? Hopefully you did. I mean, thank, thank God. Thank God that this, this man's father comes out to him. And what I'm telling you is, friends, what I'm telling you is, is that God deals with the hearts of his people. Verse 28 says, but he was angry and refused to go in. And his father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your commands. Yet you, you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate 
with my friend? Who's the brother thinking of right here? Bubba or Self? Self. Not, 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 not uh, little Bubba. Not thinking about him at all. He's thinking about Self. And I know the past few weeks I've been talking about uh, individual churches and how we need to be aware. We need to be aware of what's going on within the church of God today. We need to be really, really aware. But I'm telling you, you want to know what, what curve falls the church when they start thinking of self and what they can get out of it. So here, he's guilty of it. He says, but he answered his father, look, these, these many years I've served you. And I never disobeyed your command, Dad. You, 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 you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. He's so much worried about his own time. He's so much worried about stuff that's not even his. He's so worried about what daddy thinks about another individual that he can't even get the focus off of himself long enough to rejoice that someone who is destined and lost eating with, with the pig's pods has come back home in the safety of his father. And so, yes, there is such a thing as selfish Christians in the church, but that don't make it right, does it? says in verse 15 or rather verse 30 but when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes you killed the fattened calf for him in other words what he's saying in his selfishness and his own self pity is this as bad as he was you still forgave him and it's hard for his mind to understand that because he's not sold out to the passion of mercy He's lacking compassion in his heart for his own blood right now, for his own kin. He's, he's lacking it. And he's looking at all the bad. And he's saying, hey, Dad, 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 why are you doing good here? Well, this is why I tell you that if you're here and you've done bad, 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 and you feel that you're at the bottom of the barrel, the good news is your Heavenly Father does exactly like this dad does in this story. Your Heavenly Father forgives you of all that you've done through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's incredible stuff, man. You, you, if you're unsaved, you're not going to understand it right away. You just need to trust it, and that's called faith. Verse 31, he says, And he said to him, Son, you're always with me, and all that's mine is what? Yours. And so here's a dad pleading with his son. He says, a Son, you, you, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this. Your brother was dead, son. And now he's alive. He was lost. And now your brother is what? I love what happens in this text right there because that daddy had every right to be angry if he wanted to be in the flesh. The young, young man asked for his father's inheritance early. Daddy hadn't even died yet. And he says, hey, Dad, give me what's mine. So the dad in love to his younger son, he, he gives it to him because he loves him. You see what I'm saying? You, you give your children anything, it's just not going to harm them. He, he gives them all of the stuff that he was going to give them when he died. He, he gives it to them early. And, and the, the dad has to sit there, and he's got to watch his son squander it. but it still didn't make his dad angry to the point of rejection. Because the text says that he's looking out. And we don't know exactly what the dad was doing, but somewhere he just happened to be looking in the general area and something catches his eye as a father. He looks from afar and he says, ah, he walked like him got his head down high, 
what it does look like. I'm, I can't see his face. It's too. But that's the path he always walked when he left, and he's he's on that path. It's his path. And I look like him. Quick, quick, sir. Come here, come here, come here. I want you to go down there, and I want you to take the best robe I got, and I want you to go put it over his shoulders, and I want you to get my best ring. Get my best ring, and I want you to take it down there, and I want you to put my best ring on his hand so that even before he comes in my presence, he knows that I've accepted him. And some of you here today, you have not received Jesus truly as Lord and Savior, but you're in his presence. You're truly in the presence of God. I've felt it since the beginning of church. You're in the presence of God. And so the question is, just like the youngest son, what will you do with it? Will you let Christ clothe you with himself? What will you do with it? Let's stand and pray. What will you do with it? If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to save your soul, or maybe you're here today and you've asked Christ to be Lord of your life, but you've walked away and and you're ready to get back on track, I I, I welcome you right where you are. Just raise your hand. Raise your hand. If, if, If you're ready to receive Jesus as your king, as your leader, prince of peace in and over your life, if you're ready to trust Jesus Christ as Lord, allow today to be your day, friend. Because truth of the matter is, it's time to get serious. It's time to get serious. It's time to be serious. Young man right here with his hand raised. Come up here, brother. Come up here. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else that says, hey, Pastor, I've, I've walked away. I just want to rededicate my life front of the church, in front of the believers of Christ. Any of you here today that's committed and ready to make it a stand to say, God, use me to hunt down the lost. Use me to find the sinner. Use me and may your glory shine through me so that others can see the truth of the gospel, so that others could see the truth of Christ so that others will see and hear what I have to say from you, Father, and they would implore the way, the truth, and the life, and they would have a desire to know the true way to heaven. If you're here today and you have a desire that God use you now increasingly more than he ever has, I invite you to raise your hand and we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray for you. I've always said, when you stand up for Christ, you're going to stand out. And so just get used to that. Get ready. If you're here in this sanctuary and you have a desire to be used for the glory of God, to show the way, the truth, and the life to the sinner, I'm going to welcome you to come to this altar and we're going to pray. Come on up if that's you. I thank you for every person in this room, especially for those that have come forward with a desire to serve you. So I pray that their eyes are opened now like never before. Almighty God, I pray that their ears would hear clearly. I pray in the name of the blood of Jesus Christ that there'd be nothing stopping them or hindering them from receiving the plan that you have for each and every one of them throughout their day. 
that the 99 would not interfere with the one. That the 99 would not interfere with the one. Even if we just take a minute to encourage. God, may, may we understand that you've given us so many minutes in our day. So many minutes. May, may we take a minute to encourage. May we take a minute to love. May we take a minute to share with the lost. May we take a minute out of our 99 to give to the one that so desperately needs the minute whether they realize it or not. So Father, I pray that we understand clearly each and every person that we're to spend time with, each and every person that is the one. And when we hear it, may we not shrug it off. When we hear it, may we not turn an eye. When we hear it, may we not concentrate on the 99. But I pray in the name and the blood of Jesus Christ that from this day forward, we concentrate on the one. Because the 99 will only, will only be as strong as the hearts of those that are willing to love the one. Not self. Father, we love you. I pray in the name of the blood of Jesus Christ that every person in here returns home safely today. And as we get ready to have our baptismal service in the next few moments, we continue to thank you for the power of your sweet presence. And we thank you, God, that you have welcomed us here today. How incredible is that? May we always remember that we are to not just snatch the lost from the flames, but we're to have mercy on the doubting. And so rather than have judgmental hearts and judgmental minds and judgmental spirits on people that don't believe what we believe, help us to have mercy as we show them the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus precious name we pray all these things friends and everyone in agreement said together amen and amen god is good amen amen love you brother congratulations congratulations